Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the session where nature meets conflict. So current security paradigms were developed in a world that no longer exists. Human activities have brought profound changes to the Earth, the results of which are frequently unpredictable, rapidly evolving, novel, and intricate. While we have been framing the ecological disruption narrowly in terms of climate change, it actually encompasses a wide array of issues such as biodiversity loss, water scarcity, loss of fertile land, pollution, plastics, and biogeochemical overabundance with diverse societal and security implications and immense challenges to risk management. But the relationship between security and earth system stability is yet to be considered in high-level decision-making. Some attention is being given to hotspots, such as the Western Sahel and the Horn of Africa, and the intersection of rising temperatures, food insecurity, weak governance, and ultimately collective violence. But the impacts of extreme weather events and resources scarcity in migration flows within and beyond national borders is still to be studied profoundly. There's also a debate in security circles about the risks of climate shocks and stresses in relation to military readiness but the issue also needs to be mainstreamed. Furthermore, the discussion tends to be one directional, <coughs> focusing on the association between climate change and nature degradation and insecurity, rather than also on the other way around. This is a very clear uh, in the region where uh, Antonella and I also come from, uh, the Amazon Basin, where we see widespread environmental crimes generating massive deforestation, taking us very close to tipping points that are very dangerous for both climate and nature. So we need to take a look at the broader picture. At the Global Future Council on Nature and Security that I co-chair, Wirgen Vögele from the World Bank, we are calling to different stakeholders to reimagine human, national and global security on a changing earth. Security can no longer be conceptualized as a zero-sum game. This new context demands cooperative and systemic security strategies that our current systems were not designed to provide. And we urgently need massive investments in risk mitigation, adaptation, and resilience promotion, especially for those communities that are least resourced to cope and adapt to the short to long-term implications of climate shocks and extreme events. And to discuss what to do about all this, we're extremely lucky to have with us here Antonella Di Ciano, Global Shaper from the Caracas Hub, Venezuela, Feke Sibesman, uh, Chairman of the Supervisory Board of Royal Phillips, Member of the Board of Trustees of the World Economic Forum, Amy Pope, Director General of the International Organization of Migration, and Jojo Mata, co-founder and chief executive officer of Stop Ecocide International. So after an initial discussion, we'll have a Q&A. So think about what you want to ask to this uh, amazing panel. And if you'd like to share about this session, please use the hashtag WEF24. So Amy, I'd like to start uh, with you. So the migration issue, I think, demonstrates very clearly this multiple crisis at the human, national, international level. And I think uh, you are the best person to give us the sense of how the disruption of Earth system is driving migration and displacement and amplifying conflict and humanitarian challenges. So thank you very much, and thanks for having the conversation. I mean, I think it's increasingly um, clear to those of us who work in the humanitarian and development space that the impact of climate on already um, uh, very vulnerable communities will be catastrophic unless um, policymakers um, and other actors start to take very urgent action. You know, we see it firsthand in places like Somalia right, where we know already communities that have been devastated by years of conflict, where there's still ongoing conflict, now facing the impact of years of drought, um, season after season, where people are unable to grow food or feed, feed their livestock. And the result of that is ma massive displacement pressure, right, for those who are lucky enough to be able to leave. For those who are less lucky, um, it often means death, right? But for those who are leaving, we're seeing millions of people who are being displaced within their countries, within systems that are ill-equipped Ill -equipped to manage the movement of people. And then um, when those people are unable to remain in country because 
of insufficient opportunities or continued conflict, we then see movement across borders. So this is increasingly important that we collectively begin to grapple with ways to build resilience to climate impact and to do so in ways that are conflict sensitive. Um, it's, it's a very underdeveloped area of work um, for all of us who will work in this field. We should go back to that because I think uh, most people think migration will only occur across borders, but the impact within the countries, within the cities, I mean, will be immense. And I think this, uh, this has to be really highlighted. So I'll go to fake it because I think um, we don't think about nature as, let's say, the, the source of our economies. So more than half of the world GDP depends on ecosystem services, the services provided by planet, by nature. So how can businesses adequately address risks emanating from nature disruption? Yeah, good. Uh, not only how, uh, they, they must. Uh, uh, I totally agree uh, with Amy. I mean, we don't need to go to all the devastating impacts of climate. I think we all know that. Uh, and by the way, I often say, especially in Europe, by the way, we should realize that because Africa next to Bangladesh and other regions, Africa is hit hardest and people will not find a boat to Canada but will find a boat to Italy and to Europe. And Europe cannot handle the migration of today, already not. And the only solution is to help Africa and not to find all kinds of migration pro issues and, and whatever uh, solutions in, in Europe, no, to do it on the ground there and to take care uh, we, we, we don't suffer and we don't cause these further uh, problems. As Maki Sal, I quoted him often last year, said in the Climate Adap Adaptation Conference that I co-chaired with Ban Ki-moon, we Africans suffer the most, we Africans are the most vulnerable, we Africans cause the least, and you of the West, dot, dot, dot. Mm -hmm. So, um, and, and some people say, well, if we start like this, it's not helpful. And I said, and I repeated, I think uh, it's inconvenient what he's saying, but it is totally not incorrect. Mm -hmm. So uh, we need to do something. Now, as you said correctly, almost half of our global GDPs are agricultural and input related streams. And next to the fact that we need to work on loss and damage, because there is a loss and there is a damage and somebody caused it and somebody needs to be compensated. Next to the fact that we need to work on mitigation to prevent that this whole devastating actions continue. We need to work in parallel on adaptation and, and help the people, especially in Africa, because they need help right now. We don't talk about streets who are flooded or whatever. We talk like Amy is saying, uh, they don't have enough food anymore, so people die. That's something else than that the cellar is underwater or whatever. Um, I still don't understand, I'm not smart enough for this maybe, uh, why business is so absent on climate adaptation. Business is globally uh, financing about <coughs> half a percent of the global adaptation budget. Mm -hmm. Really? I think there are two reasons why business should step up. One is the self-interest of business. I don't get that one either. If you're dependent, like you indicated, uh, from agricultural input streams, they will be disrupted over time, and that will harm your own business and your own operations. So there's all kinds of self-interest of business to prevent and to take care uh, and to adapt to ourselves. The second thing, businesses have the solutions uh, to help. For example, in Africa, a lot of drought, some Bangladesh, a lot of floodings. There are new seeds, new agricultural techniques, etc which can provide food also when it is flooded or drought. Those things should become available for the most vulnerable. They need that right now. So both of a health point of view, both of a self-interest point of view, business need to step up. And that is what we try to do also with global climate adaptation centers. And I don't even find the rational argument for business not to do that next to the humanitarian, next to the responsibility, and all kinds of other arguments which are there. So therefore we say, uh, this business has to react, it must, for several reasons. I think we all agree with you. We'll go back to that on how to raise ambition. Exactly. <laughs> and I think, um, Jojo, 
you come with an issue that uh, since we have to accelerate action <coughs> and ambition from all sides, not only business, governments as well. And I think also like there's a lot of individual change that we have to promote uh, to just uh, really get where we need to get. So you work on a very new concept called ecocide. So many people don't understand what this legal definition is and what does it bring. So can you please explain a little bit to us, but also tell us in your opinion, uh, what has to change in current business and investment models to make sure this long-term thinking and ecological considerations are included in decisions and practices? Absolutely. So, I mean, ecocide as a word is becoming more, it's becoming better known around the world. And the concept is generally mass damage and destruction of nature. Um, but legally speaking, um, what our organisation and other collaborators aim to do is to have this recognised legally as a serious crime. Because one of the issues that sort of pervades all of this discussion is that we have a kind of cultural, very ingrained habit of not taking damage to nature as seriously as we take damage to people and property. Um, and that, I mean, you know, if you're campaigning for human rights, at least you know mass murder, torture, all of these things are serious crimes. But there's no equivalent in the environmental space. Um, and so, and, and you know, unlike a, an international crime like genocide that in, involves a specific intent, with ecocide, what we see is actually what people are trying to do, what businesses are trying to do is make money, is, you know, is farm, is fish, is do all of these things that are um, you know, producing energy and so on um, as well. But what's it, what's missing is the awareness and the conscience around the side effects, around the collateral damage that happens with that. And so putting a, a, a sort of outer boundary, a safety rail parameter in place that simply says, whatever you do, it should not create this level of severity, severe long-term and widespread harm. It actually starts to then steer decision-making and steer business, uh, business projects and um, effectively all of those high level decisions that actually end up with the suffering that we're seeing on the ground have those all sort of steered in a healthier direction so um, something that's not really covered by loss and damage mitigation adaptation is actually deterrence and prevention mm -hmm. you know we're all talking a little bit as though you know the change that the changes that are happening and the shocks that are happening are inevitable but actually there are quite simple <coughs> Um, for example, you know, with ecocide, it's a really straightforward kind of intervention um, at the legal level that could actually start to steer everything in a healthier direction. For governments as well, right? Absolutely, for governments, for individuals, for businesses, yeah. It, it's interesting because increasingly you see now in the legal systems the question, who have rights who can be defended? And normally in our normal thinking, it is humans, people, who have rights and can defend them. Things, nature, countries in itself, <clears throat> fields, cannot defend themselves. So they have no rights. And in the legal system, there's increasingly the question, people cannot defend them, or things that cannot defend themselves, could they still own rights? Mm -hmm. And then you come into the area of, of Jojo. Although I question, not question, I think we, think I'm, I'm not on the solutions, but I'm not sure we think always alike, but on what is happening, we do. Uh, I quote Kumi Naido, previous um, uh, good friend in previous... Big fan of Ecoside Law. Sorry? Big fan of Ecoside Law, too. <laughs> Although, I quote him, and he's a good friend of me also, and he said from Greenpeace, I don't care about nature. One of his statements. He said, listen, I care about mankind. I mean, when you are expelled, mm -hmm. nature will restore itself. Don't worry. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm not caring about nature at all. I care about mankind. And to your point, if we kill nature, and we do that partly, is that something that we do to nature? I quote Kumi. I said, well, or indirectly, we kill people. And that is the issue. I don't know how you see that. I mean, it's uh, absolutely. I mean, ultimately, this is about... Oh, it's protection of nature, but we are utterly dependent on nature. We're utterly totally. intertwined with nature. Um, and so, you know, if, if we don't take that into account, we are, you know, on a path to yeah. some very big problems. No, absolutely. I think it's people and planet and people because we will vanish, as you said. The planet, I, you know, w w somebody else will take care of it. Yeah. But uh, this brings, uh, Faye mentioned something very interesting, Antonella, because... Um, Nature doesn't go to the police station to tell what happens. Uh, so for many, many 
like uh, countries, what we call environmental crimes or nature crime, are very underreported. This was an issue of secondary, uh, let's say, uh, secondary crime for many police forces, including until today in some parts. So we have very hands-on experience and would love to hear from you because your country, your region, are struggling with the association of environmental crime and organized crime, an issue that I'm also very, very keen to, to collaborate with you. So how do you see this nexus between nature and security when it comes to social conflict and violence? So what prevention strategies uh, could be applied? So yes, uh, so talking about big problems, I come from Venezuela, uh, I'm 28 years old, I worked for six years for the FCDO, the UK FCDO uh, in the region in Venezuela, and that's when I first came across the environmental crime concept, which was completely unknown to me. And uh, since then I continued the research and I'm now a Fulbright grantee in Duke University, continuing the research on environmental crime in the Amazonian rainforest. So southern Venezuela, uh, what we call Bolivar State, has something very controversial called the Orinoco Mining Arc. The Orinoco Mining Arc was stated by the Venezuelan regime in 2016 uh, in the midst of oil pricing reduction and the production of oil failing for Venezuela. Uh, and it is a zone that is completely dedicated for mining purposes. It is a zone rich of gold, coal, tan, diamonds, and we all know what comes with that, which is precisely ecocide. Uh, these mines are in hands of irregular groups, transnational crime. Uh, we have local what they call sindicatos or uh, armed working groups. We have the Brazilian garimpeiros, which are like the artisan uh, miners. We have presence of the ELN and FARC dissidents in there. Uh, Guyana miners as well. So this is uh, like a big soup of organized crime in control of the mines. They are interrelated and they created sort of a symbiotic relationship with the Venezuelan government because they're all connect collecting revenues from this huge environmental degradation because they're using illicit products such as mercury uh, to explode gold. So talking about GDP, Transparency International, the chapter, the Venezuelan chapter, uh, recently had some numbers uh, exposed saying that 16% of the Venezuelan GDP now is because of illicit economies. And it comes in its great part because of gold and the illegal mining that is happening. So this is a huge environmental degradation. It's one of the, because of the mine, the. Uh, the Orinoco mining art is part of the Amazonian rainforest. It's one of the fastest growing deforestation in the entire rainforest. 70% uh, of the gold that's collected there is gone to smuggling and illicit crimes. And talking also about human displacement, this mining uh, communities overlap with indigenous communities who have been displaced and they're now in phases of tremendous violence conflict and health hazards. There was a local NGO recently doing uh, studies to the health of these indigenous communities that were displaced, and most of them have mercury in their blood systems, precisely because all of the rivers have been contaminated with mercury and the ways they are irregularly exploding gold. Yeah, we share this border with you, the Venezuelan yes, border in the north of Brazil, and it's super tough, and we see the migration issue. So Amy, I would like to go back to you because these are, let's say, very visible crises today. And we know this will be exacerbated and climate and nature. And again, we're trying to explain this, na this, this nexus that, uh, you know, this, is a, this becomes a stability issue when we disrupt nation, when we just uh, also don't provide the livelihoods to people. So, uh, you know, that nature, nature ends up paying the bill. So can you give us a, a bit of a, let's say, hope here? on how international, national, subnational strategies to address this nexus could be, let's say, uh, we're not talking at the decision-making level. How can we increase the importance of these issues to then mobilize finance, improve the partnerships that are there today? And I think the migration is, uh, nobody can deny, it's an it's a issue that today put us uh, uh, it's in, the, in all election ballots that we're going to have uh, this year. Uh, like this will be that is it for so many countries. So JoJo put it very well when she said that um, we don't need to take as a given 
the impact of climate change on vulnerable communities. In fact, the evidence shows that in 80% of the projected displacements, that fairly straightforward interventions could help stabilize communities and build resilience. Mm -hmm. But there are two different problems that I think we need to address. The first is where the climate um, impact on vulnerable communities will fuel conflict, mm -hmm. right? We see that um, across the world where there are scarce resources and persons, particularly those who are dependent on the land, either for agriculture or um, pastoralists for feeding their livestock, are both using the same water resources and then the conflict results as a, uh, because of that um, scarcity. So there, it's a question of identifying ways to build resilience. Some of it's water infrastructure management. Some of it is identifying additional skills that people could rely on. Some of it is even identifying where else people in the world may find economic opportunities and sort of um, uh, moving away from the particular zone of conflict. But the second, and this one I think is a little bit more complicated, it's where we see conflict in communities that are severely climate impacted, right? So you go back to, um, I was in Chad on Wednesday, right? We're seeing uh, over 600,000 people have fled the conflict in Sudan there. Chad is already extremely vulnerable to climate impact. Um, and the ability to operate and create more resilience in a community that is already impacted by conflict and already extremely vulnerable is much more difficult. So then we very much need to look at what are the adjacent communities where we can build resilience. If it's not safe to build up climate resilience or bring in adaptation me uh, measures because of conflict, well, what's the downstream impact, right? And how can we work with neighboring communities in order to build their resilience? Yeah, I mean, we see the impact on cities, and I'll yeah. just go back to you on the raising ambition, because you mentioned very well that uh, there's also, let's say, it's in business self-interest, there's opportunities uh, with this crisis, there's also, of course, the intent that we continue to have an economy in the world. And uh, I think we have all the science. Yesterday we were speaking here to you know, one of the members of the, the, the Nature and Security Council, Johan Rockström. Science is there. But we don't have the narrative. Some people don't get it. Some, we're not connecting. So how do we raise ambition for net zero, for nature positive uh, practices? And I think uh, more and more business will also have to do the public-private uh, partnership. So from your perspective in business, with your counterparts when you have to go into public partnerships, how do we do that? Why we're not touching people? Yeah, I think we all agree that we have devastating issues uh, and that are the most vulnerable countries and the most vulnerable people are at this moment the victim of that one first. Uh, and, and that is a fact. Now we need to move. I think everybody would agree we need to move and we need to move faster. Question is how? And I think what you see in the world is that we do that how from multiple directions and actions. Um, if we see crimes, we can say it is a crime and we bring them to justice. Mm -hmm. um, we define uh, the right of nature uh, by calling ecocides things uh, as they are and therefore defend and therefore attack uh, the people who are not adhering to that. That's quite a push, uh, quite a pressure. And that's helpful. You can debate whether you can be criminalized if you did not infringe laws, Jojo will say, but I'm going to change the laws. Um, and, and, and then you can be criminalized if you infringe the laws which need to be created, and I'm an advocate of creating those laws. Okay, I think you need to be careful, because that is not our global system, uh, to criminalize people who did not infringe laws. Although, you can condemn them from a moral point of view, from a humanitarian point of view if you uh, do not take up your responsibility. That is a kind of, of, of pressure. And at this moment, there are more than 3,000 lawsuits against companies infringing um, um, uh, the rights of nature. Real lawsuits. 80 lawsuits against countries, 3,000 against companies. So something is happening, and companies will say, well, this is far away from me, I would say, be careful, that's mm -hmm. not the case. That is the pressure and it's happening and I think uh, you need to be careful how you do so because if you have criminalized companies or people, 
maybe then thereafter they are not the best one to help you also with the solutions because they feel threatened. So think about that. But I see the right or I see the, 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 the effects of that. The other thing is to seduce companies and to help companies getting more insight. Now here at the forum, to be honest, I've talked many times about adaptation. And still, also this week, being in another session, uh, some CEO said, um, help me, Fika, uh, how do you define exactly the difference between mitigation and adaptation? And I think that's also a nice way of phrasing or asking that you have really no clue what is the difference between the two uh, and that you did not uh, dive into that. And I think we need to uh, bring the knowledge level much higher and seduce then companies uh, and to bring them together to use their power because the private sector has the power, the public sector has the legal power, but not the implementation and innovative power that need to come from the private sector to implement. The other thing is building coalitions, what the WEF is doing uh, here very much, and building coalitions of the willing. And then we have always a discussion also with the WEF of naming and shaming, and I'm not for naming and shaming, I'm more from the naming. <laughs> this is our alliance. And you know what? NGOs, media, etc. they will find out who is in that progressive coalition and who said, I don't want to be part of it. Well, that other part happens then by itself without us doing that. So I see that we take multiple directions of solving these this, this issues. What I'm concerned about is the speed. Are we moving fast enough? And for many people in vulnerable countries, there are 50 island states in the world. They see their whole country, the whole future, disappearing in the coming decades. Gone. No place to live. And we cannot easily, we found that out in the Middle East, pick up a lot of people and place them in another area. That does not work uh, easily. So what do we do uh, with that? Um, so I'm concerned about that. And therefore, I put all my effort here, together with the WEF, of building this coalition. We have this coalition um, of CEO climate leaders. And not everybody wants to be in there. OK, mm -hmm. I cannot force people. But some companies want to step up and do that. Um, and therefore, this week, uh, together with Eric, with Eric sitting here, um, uh, off the WEF, we um, uh, started a community. It's small, too small, uh, but a business community on helping on adaptation. Do you have the technologies? Do you have the solutions? Yes. Then you have the obligation, oops, uh, to help also implementing that. Jojo want to interrupt me. <laughs> Please go <laughs> ahead, Jojo. This is quite a short panel, but, um, but yeah, no, I mean, a couple of things. One, you'd probably be surprised at how many CEOs, including CEOs of major extractive companies, have told us in confidence that they really hope that we get this law moving through, yeah, which, yeah. Is, which is happening, because then they're actually able to say to their boards, we need to do things if the law work. is there, we you all know, know where this we are. Is, you know, it's ultimately, you know, the people who are already going in the right direction don't need this, you know, it's, it's, it's those who, yeah. who perhaps are not thinking about it that actually just need that framework. Um, and I think the other thing is the slight misconception of criminal law, if you forgive me, I slightly detect in your um, uh, approach, which is that um, it's seen as a, as, as a means of punishment. Now, of course, that's true. That's how it works. But that's not what it's for. I mean, murder isn't a crime to punish murderers. It's a crime to stop us killing each other. That's the whole point. So the idea is that when you put something like that in place, um, you start to shift the kinds of decisions that are being made because that's in place. So, you know, in our ideal world, we don't see anybody in the dock because everybody's going, oh, of course, you know, we can't do that because actually that, that, that oversteps a certain line. And I think the other thing that's interesting is you were talking about island states, and actually it's those small island states who are really sort of driving this. And it's interesting that it's the victims, both in the climate and in the conflict context. So Ukraine is a very vocal supporter of ecocide law. And I think it's very interesting that those two really key global problems actually kind of coincide at this same legal gap. It's very interesting. Jojo, the only thing is, uh, not the only thing, uh, wrong start. Um, <laughs> the uh, maybe struggle question I have. At this moment, there are 3,000 lawsuits against companies. Mm -hmm. And companies in the world realize that that is happening. And I know that a lot of companies are saying today, 
I'm not going to set targets anymore of my reductions and my contributions. Because if I set targets, don't achieve it, then I can be uh, brought for court. So I stopped setting targets, and it is happening right now. And then I think we go the wrong direction, because I want them to set targets. And I even want them to hold responsible to achieving the targets, but maybe not in a criminal way, because I understand that then they won't set targets. Here is a little bit the difficulty. And how do you hold them responsible in a legal way, in a moral way, in a publicitary way, in, in whatever way? And I don't know the answer, but I only see the effects what's happening right now. But just add in to fake, and then if you want to just, uh, I think the, um, we do need the transition plans because we need the companies to make, you know, the commitments. We need the the, the goals, and of course we need to understand who is actually doing something towards the goals and who is just putting the goals to just, uh, you know, shy away from the debate and leave me alone. So I think um, we need to find the balance, which is this in this world today. This is very hard. Um, but would you like this to comment on, because I, I was thinking the other way around. I think, well, this can nudge companies to actually accept and uh, put forward transition plans with goals. And the, how do you see that? It's interesting. I mean, we, we sort of see it as a bit of a, a kind of reality check type, uh, law, if you like. Um, I mean, it, and it is in a very different sphere to the kind of... It, you know, treaties and agreements that don't hit on the criminal side. Because, I mean, yeah. Uh, boards of directors are going to take their responsibility. You know, I'll, I'll come back to actually to what you were saying earlier about creating new crimes. This actually doesn't create new crimes. It builds on and supports existing law. That's one of the key aspects to it. Um, but companies take their responsibilities um, a lot more seriously. You know, if they understand that you know there's there's a level of criminality involved, and that doesn't really have anything to do with targets. We call it a kind of a reality check. Um, I mean, at the moment, I mean, actually, interestingly, e the EU is moving quite strongly in this direction. In the envi revised Environmental Crimes Directive, they've actually included cases comparable to ecocide um, across a range of existing crimes, you know, if they, if they go that serious. But one of the things that we see is that when you give people a list of things that they shouldn't do, specific behaviours that they shouldn't do, they'll put a lot of effort into making sure that what they do doesn't fall into that list. Mm -hmm. Um, the, important with, the important thing with the concept of ecocide and the way that it's moving with the international definition that has triggered political conversations all around the world and many proposals of law, in fact, is that what it aims to do is to say it, it's almost like a criminal version of a health and safety law in the sense that you say that whatever you do, it should not create this level of hazard. I mean, you wouldn't design a factory to almost break people's heads open on a regular basis. You design it so it's not going to break people's heads open. It's, it's that kind of attitude. And so when you do that, you create a slightly different... Um, when I say reality check, you create a different attitude. So instead of your you know, risk uh, managers and your legal counsels looking at how do you avoid falling into a certain category, um, and let's not forget that you know, the, the, a lot of the greatest damage is created by large companies, large multinational corporations. Instead, what you're going to be looking at is talking to your operational people and saying what on the ground is happening that might trigger this law. And therefore, you're actually having to make that connection with what's actually happening, as opposed to it staying sort of up here with the how do we avoid the, you know, how do we gain the system? It becomes a kind of connection to what's actually happening on the planet. And I think that's something that is desperately needed. Um, you know, we have a big tendency to, you know, to talk about, you know, incentives and, 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 and I'm not saying that incentives aren't a great thing, but I think we also have to keep coming back to the fact that we live on a planet that our biggest companies are regularly creating harm to. Whether or not that's what they actually intend to do, that's what's happening. And so putting that, um, that sort of reality check law in place is super, super important. And it's, it's, not, it's not an innovation in the sense that it's not, you know, it's not a completely new crime. It's building on existing environmental law that is currently being ignored or gained because there is no really serious impact to breaking that. And I think that the other thing with criminal law is that when you bring in individual responsibility, and here we speak to the conflict in Ukraine, for example, when you can point to an act that actually creates a massive level of damage. I mean, the Kokovka Dam being a, a classic incident. You know, should you not be able to hold people accountable for an act like that that is effectively massively destructive to the environment but currently not adequately addressed? But crime is an infringement of law, right? Yeah, so you have to... So we need to be clear what the laws are 
before you can be condemned on a crime. You also have and to have a system to enforce those laws. I mean, that's the major, this is the major tension, I think, of this conversation. Sure. When we're talking about conflict impacted areas of the world, it's very unlikely that they have the systems in place to hold people accountable exactly. to the level at which we're talking. So that that's where I think we have to try to build in. So where's the jurisdiction where you can actually hold someone accountable? Well, How do you, right? I 100% agree. And that is by company, if we have a factory in Europe and uh, put things into the river, you cannot do that. You build a wastewater treatment system. You cannot dump it in the river. Full stop. Yeah. Okay. Then in some other countries, for example, China, yeah. you can uh, put it in the river. It's legal. It's allowed. The competition is doing it also. It's changing now rapidly, but there are different jurisdictions in the world. And, uh, and my question is, if we build a wastewater treatment for the same factory here and not over there, we are totally legal. In my company, in our, in, you cannot do that because although it's fully legal, it's not a crime, it's morally totally wrong. If we think we cannot spoil the people here and poison them here, we cannot do that with people there also. Whatever is the law system in, mm. in that country. So therefore, I want to go further to your point, Amy. I want to go further than the legal uh, system. And then you go, you go away from China and you go into a country like Sudan at the moment. Right. Where you have no governance, right? Exactly. You are in the middle of a war and... Uh, I right, yeah. then what remedies do we actually have? And if we move a little bit further, what if it's not only companies perpetrating these crimes? What if it's actually the state? How do you hold them accountable? How do you pose an entire legal framework and an entire legal system to a state that is actually perpetrating these environmental crimes? Yeah, that would be easier on the ones that are signatory for the Hague Convention. Yeah, so that's, that's actually something right. that is already happening there. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, and that can... conversation is building there very... Yeah, um, but I mean, I want to give the audience a chance, but I wanted to finally, a uh, final question to you, because this is, um, we know around the world, uh, younger people uh, feeling anxious about what they, they, right. they know is yes, happening <laughs> without, uh, let's say, the power to change. In a fragmented, uh, unfortunately, a world that we need more cooperation, we need the enforcement, and we don't have even the conversation. So we're here. Uh, at a at a WEF to to build trust, right? To to go back to the table, uh, we really need that. So, how can we bring this intergenerational perspective? We're discussing at the UN now the rights of the future generations, but I think we have to include not only the future generation, but the children, the young people that are here now. So, how do you how do you see that, and how can we bring you to this conversation? Uh, well, we're we're starting right because I think including young leaders uh, into the conversations is one of the big steps. I heard some data ye yesterday from WEF saying that more than half of the population is considered young under 30 years, but we currently do not represent even 3% of the decision-making positions worldwide. So uh, that's the first thing, that's the basis that needs to change because we need to give young people the expectations to be able to, okay, if I can sit in the table, if I can at least have my voice be heard, then this is worth it. This is worth investigating. This is worth having. And there's so many young initiatives worldwide that are taking over and that are tackling these topics. I had the pleasure to work with, for instance, a Brazilian NGO called Info Amazonia, which is currently doing um, a technological advances in uh, reporting environmental crime. So they're doing satellite monitoring on the Amazonian rainforest to map deforestation. So they're working on this incredible project and giving governments irrefutable information of how deforestation is working and how it's actually linked to serious okay. organized crime. So I think if we actually give these young leaders opportunities to sit on the table, to be part of the decision-making processes, to the legal everything, uh, it's going to start moving a bit faster. I agree, and I mean, meet the global shapers, and they're going to see that we, <laughs> we have the responsibility to live like, a, you know, when you take the pen, the world has to be, yet, you know, like, we have the possibility to save it, because it, they're amazing. So <laughs> make sure you connect to the shapers during this, uh, during this laugh and beyond. And I would like just to ask, uh, who would like to, to ask questions to our panelists? We have a short time, so very brief questions. The conversation is too heated. Maybe nobody <laughs> wants to get in. I will continue. There is one here, please. <laughs> Thanks for Ant <clears throat> Antonella Di Ciano. It's a situation in Bolivar State, uh, a question of the collapse of the entire Venezuelan state. 
Yes, of course. Um, I think it's it's one of the answers because of the collapse of the entire Venezuelan state. That's why our GDP has moved forward to illicit economies. That's why the whole answer of the creation to the famous uh, Arco Minero or the Orinoco mining arc, mm -hmm. uh, we're moving a bit more uh, towards illicit economies. And illicit economy, economies come with environmental degradation that we've seen in illegal mining. So it's uh, we have illegal miners now uh, moving from other countries to Venezuela and even there's internal displacement because it's more profitable to work on mines and in gold mining now in Venezuela than any other job. So uh, yes, it's a complete response of the economic collapse in Venezuela. Anybody else? Yeah, one here, one there. Maybe we take the two and then let's take a first and second and then we come back to the panel, please. Hello, good afternoon. Thank you very much for the discussion. I am a global shaper from Bogota that also works on forest protection and conservation, especially in the Amazon. And environmental crimes is one of the most, I think, uh, and challenging drivers of deforestation to tackle because it's on a regional scale. And I wanted to ask uh, the panel, what strategies do you see, for example, to be able to address these issues on a regional scale uh, taking advantage that Latin America is some, somehow aligned politically and that there's a lot of importance put in the Amazon and in the, in the Masonic uh, biome. Thank you. Let's get a second one and then we come back for a final round here. Hi, Rebecca Braswell, Land Life. My question is, how can you anticipate the potential risks in Say you're able to reverse or protect the environment and the potential social backlash for those high paying jobs all of a sudden being taken away. How can we make sure that environmental protection and restoration also provides meaningful futures for these people in this country? Thank you so much. So maybe Amy, just to, uh, the answers uh, to any of them with your final reflections, please. Um, I actually think there's tremendous opportunity in building out um, a, a workforce for the future, right? Especially when you, with when many of the communities where we work, um, people are reliant on things like rainfall agriculture, which we know is going to become increasingly difficult. At the same time, we know that we will be unlikely to meet the Paris Green Climate Goals because we don't have sufficient migration in order to get the people right. who have the skills to do things like, for example, manufacturing of solar panels. So there's an alignment of interests that I think can work out very well here if we start to connect the dots across borders and invest in training, particularly of young people, so that they have the skills in order to enable them to be part of the future. Super, thank you for bringing that. Jojo. Um, yeah, I mean, it, we, we obviously focus on the, the the thou shalt not, I suppose, you know, that, that, that side of things. But what's interesting is that what it's bringing up, for example, in the discussions at the ICC, at the International Criminal Court, are issues of restorative justice, for example. Um, and, the, you know, those kind of, those aspects um, are, going, are becoming an ever increasing focus. And I think things like, I mean, to, to speak to your point earlier about um, our capacity to, yeah. to deal with these things, you know, the trainings, the reporting, the, the education around investigation, the data mapping, all of these things are kind of developing in parallel. And, and this would actually bring me as, as a last point back um, to you again, actually, because I completely... Careful with me. I can, no, no, I just, I just I wanted to agree with you about the cultural aspect of the concept and how important that is. And what we've realised is that the two things kind of move along in tandem in terms of a narrative, because actually what the concept um, brings, is, you know, that effectively, you know, we already know it's bad, wrong and dangerous to, to damage people and so on. Um, but to, to actually have that equivalent around the natural world has those implications for people. And it, it has the beginnings of what we might need, which is a kind of a taboo, you know, to have a taboo around mass destruction of nature. And of course it's a balancing act because you can't build a house without damaging something. You know, so effectively it is all about balance. And I think at that point, we also need to look to those local communities, those indigenous cultures that have never lost that understanding of that connection mm -hmm. um, and, and actually realize that it's it's an, an issue of balance um, and that, you know, beyond a certain point, it's out of balance. And we are obviously right now very Thank out of so balance. Much. We have 30 seconds for each of you. OK, I could go um, going back to Alfonso's question on I think cross-border policy is key. 
Uh, for instance, uh, I don't know if you've seen, but there's a recent research on OECD and illegal gold mining. And one of the solutions they propose is how, they post an entire baseline on how to identify Venezuelan illegal gold. So we could hold companies accountable if we actually know they're buying illegal Venezuelan gold. And that's how, from the outside, you're starting to put constraints into illegal mining and actually not make more profitable what illegal mining is costing and the high paying jobs. So I think that's how I wrap up both. It's sad, by the way, what's happening in your country. I've been there over 20, 30 times in such a beautiful country. Yes, it is. Um, uh, to your point, I've been uh, several times also to Somalia, Ethiopia, refugee camps, and still close to me, if you stand on a hill in a refugee camp and can look to the horizon with shelters, displaced people who have no future, and increasingly no future, uh, to the horizon. I mean, this is devastating. What I think is, and you made your point, that not every country has a rule of law or can enforce it. And, uh, and I think before, because the word crime and criminal was used a few times in this conversation, and I understand the pressure created by that. And I like that there is pressure created. In addition, I would be careful with the word crime, because officially you can only, provide, only do a crime if you really infringe the law. Now you can say, but laws over time are changing, absolutely. And we want to change laws, absolutely. But there needs to be a rule of law in countries also that you can trust that if you do not infringe the current legislation, you cannot be condemned for a crime. So I think we need to be careful on that word crime and criminal. Uh, but I understand the pressure being created because I totally agree we are not moving fast enough. I want to close positive because a lot of negative uh, things and concerns were raised. And Eric and I discussed also this morning. The technologies, the solutions, the innovations, which especially the private sector can bring, it is enormous. And instead of using that for negative things, let's Absolutely. mobilize all that technology, all that innovative power to change the world to a better place. This is, by the way, the slogan of the forum and why we are here, committed to improve the state of the world. Well, if we look to the state of the world today, there's room for improvement. Absolutely. So uh, I think let's mobilize all those forces uh, to do that. Thanks. So on this positive note that I think everyone agrees, thank you so much for the audience, for these immense panelists, amazing panelists. And to be continued, this is a hot topic. Here to stay, it's about ourselves and this balance with the planet. So let's get going. Thank you so much. <laughs>